I to thank the organizers to invite me to participate in this great initiative, especially, especially to Jerome Nelly. Thank you very much. And uh, here you have the topics I am going to speak about in this talk. First, I will make a, a small introduction to atherosclerosis, current interventions in the management, key currently untreated problems in atherosclerosis. We will speak about some of these issues and then emerging opportunities to improve the diagnosis and treatment of this disease. So maybe because we've <laughs> been a bit fast, I haven't introduced you, uh, <laughs> Vicenta. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. That's, uh, that's the magic of, of life. <laughs> maybe I would just introduce you briefly so that uh, people know, know a bit of your, of your, of your background uh, before we go into, uh, into deep science. So, um, okay. so actually, uh, Vicenta and Laura are so, uh, focusing on the different uh, targets have uh, relatively uh, relatively and, and, and similar profiles. So uh, biologists working on extremely uh, complex uh, disease. So done at the molecular level and to find um, to find ways for uh, better uh, therapeutics. Uh, Vicenta Llorente Cortes, so uh, obtained her PhD. So uh, here in, in Barcelona, and she's working here in, uh, in Barcelona. Uh, during her PhD time, so she has spent uh, three years at the University of, of Bern, and uh, she eventually so stabilized so at uh, CSIC and the Hospital of, of São Paulo, uh, where she is a head scientist and coordinator of the group Lipids and, uh, and Cardiovascular Pathologies. And uh, so she has applied to and um, she has received funds competitive funds for uh, very uh, basic research in, uh, in these fields uh, to find uh, therapeutic targets and, um, and, and, and new biomarkers um, in cardiovascular disease and, and atherosclerosis. And uh, she has also made uh, the step uh, towards uh, technology transfer uh, through collaboration with uh, with companies, with um, tight collaborations with with company, so uh, she has uh, actually also uh, been working so on on a whole to uh, take the best out of uh, of research uh, to translate this into tangible solutions uh, for uh, for the society. So you now, uh, Vicenta, I leave you the floor. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, cardiovascular disease is the first cause of death uh, worldwide and ischemic heart disease represent more than 50% of deaths. Ischemic heart disease is caused by the buildup of plaque in the coronary arteries that supply oxygen rich blood to your heart. When the atherosclerotic plaque uh, grows, uh, they can break down and then platelets arrive and a thrombus is formed. This causes a deficiency in the arrival of oxygen and nutrients to the heart, provoking the acute events such as angina pectoris of acute myocardial infarction. Separate meta-analysis of over 200 prospective cohort studies, Mendelian randomization studies, and uh, randomized trials demonstrate a remarkably consistent dose-dependent association between the exposure of the vasculature to LDL and the risk of atherosclerosis. These studies also demonstrate that lowering plasma LDL particle concentrations should reduce the risk of atherosclerotic derived clinical events proportionally to the absolute LDL reduction. A successful approach to modulate LDL has proven to be the Mediterranean diet, PREDIMED, was a Spanish coordinated multicentric project that included that include more than 7,000 asymptomatic participants, but with a high cardiovascular risk, who were followed for five years. The main conclusion of that study was the incidence of myocardiovascular events were much reduced among those participants assigned to a Mediterranean diet supplemented with extra virgin 
olive oil or nuts compared to those assigned to a reduced fat diet. The reduction of the cardiovascular risk was associated not only to decrease circulating aldeol cholesterol levels, levels, but also to reduce atherogenicity. Despite the consistent evidences showing that plasma LDL levels can be optimized by diet and exercise, lipid-lowering drugs are the most prescribed drugs around the world. All these drugs, mainly bile acid sequestrants or estatins or the new PCSK9 inhibitors, all treat, treat to reduce LDL cholesterol, although although by different mechanisms. For example, estetimib reduces the intestinal absorption of cholesterol, while estins or PCSK9 inhibitors uh, would make is to upregulate LDL receptors such that they make higher clearance of L plasmatic LDL cholesterol. However, there are several limitations of lipid-lowering drugs in the treatment of cardiovascular disease. Atherosclerotic plaques are usually detected by imaging techniques in subjects whose plasma LDL concentrations are within the target level set by the guides. In line with these findings, current treatments achieve a maximum of 40% of reduction in the relative risk reduction. Therefore, it's an urgent need to develop new therapies based on crucial focal and treated problems, which are key determinants of the residual risk for plaque rupture and events. Here you have a representative, uh, a schematic representation of the coronary artery wall that consists of three layers. The inner layer called intima, that is in the space between the endothelium and the media layer, mainly composed by smooth muscle cells. And finally, the adventitial layer, that is uh, the outer layer. Changes in the endothelial permeability allow the entrance of, uh, L, of circulating LDL, LDL to this spine of the, of the intima when they become trapped by the proteoglycans and become oxidized and aggregated LDL. This kind of LDL modified is taken up by scavenger receptors present in macrophages, but also in smooth muscle cells. The process of LDL retention in this proteoglycan network causes not only extracellular lipid accumulation, but also intracellular lipid accumulation at all of these processes are associated to inflammation and alter immune response. The LDL aggregation in the arterial intima depends between other factors on LDL characteristics, of course, but also on the proteoglycan composition. It is known that the small and dense LDL particles, the lipoprotein profile present in diabetes and atherogenic dyslipidemia, show higher affinity by proteoglycans and more susceptibility to LDL aggregation. In the MESA study, a medical research study involved more than 6,000 men and women, and women from six communities in the states demonstrate that the number of LDL particles is better indicator of cardiovascular risk than LDL cholesterol. In other study performed in estrogen-treated patients, an elevated number of LDL particles and non-HDL cholesterol, but not LDL cholesterol, was associated with the residual cardiovascular risk. Finally, LDL aggregation has been reported to be a novel biomarker of cardiovascular risk. All of these studies have been crucial to consider LDL retention and aggregation in the arterial intima as a new therapeutic target. In this electron microscopy image of the carotid artery intima, you can observe extracellular lipid droplets and intracellular lipid droplets inside the macrophages. 
one of the effects of intracellular lipid accumulation is the transcriptional activation of a multi a multiprotein complex termed inflammasome. Inflammasome activation induced the secretion of two pro-inflammatory cytokines, the interleukin 1 beta and interleukin 18, that potent potently exacerbate the pro-inflammatory signaling not only in macrophages but also in endothelial and smooth muscle cells. The macrophages play a key role in the regulation of local inflammation in the atherosclerotic plaque. If the balance between pro-inflammatory and pro-resolving mediators is settled towards inflammation, pyrotosis or necrotosis, that are two pro-inflammatory forms of cell death, further promote inflammation and a large ne necrotic core is for promoting plaque instability. Conversely, if the balance is titled towards pre-resolving mediators, other mechanisms such as apoptosis, autophagy, efferocytosis, or cholesterol efflux lead to the resolution of inflammation and we can get a stable plaque, plaque with a small necrotic lipid core. This findings have promoted immunotherapy as a treatment for atherosclerosis. In fact, anti-interleukin 1 beta antibody treatment has reached phase 3. Although this therapy improved primary and secondary cardiovascular disease outcomes, this antibody failed to improve overall mortality and caused an increased risk of, inf of infection. However, other immunotherapeutics are summarized in this list and are currently under development. Previous work in our lab showed a high degree of colocalization between adipophilin in green, which is a marker of foam cell formation of lipid droplet formation, and both macrophages marked with CD68, but also with smooth muscle cells marked with alpha -actin indicating that the smooth muscle cells can play a crucial role in form cell formation in human atherosclerotic lesions. Other studies reported that more than 50% of foreign cells previously considered as macrophages are from a smooth muscle cells origin, confirming the high presence of foam smooth muscle cells in the human arterial intima. Our group showed several years ago that aggregated LDL formed in the arterial intima and that has this appearance, highly enriched in cholesterol esters, are one of the main inducers of foam cell formation from smooth muscle cells. Aggregated LDL does dependently increase the intracellular cholesterol ester accumulation in smooth muscle cells that uh, appear full of lipid droplets and that are extremely positive for adipophilin, this marker of foam cell formation. Additionally, our group identified for the first time aggregated LDL as a ligand of this receptor, LRP1. And we also reported that this ligand, aggregated LDL, is able to upregulate the expression of this receptor creating a positive feedback that efficiently generate foam cells. Here you have some of the mechanisms that are altered in foam cells, in foam cells uh, with a smooth muscle cells origin. These cells increase tissue factor expression and activity, as you can see here, and also the release of TF positive microparticles, which means that these cells acquire a prothrombotic phenotype and are able to attract these platelets that form the thromb. In addition, they have decreased migratory capacity, which may contribute to decreased thickness of the fibrous cap that protects the lesion from rupture. Other phenotypic characteristics is the higher production of catepsinase and secretion of tropolastin with higher tendency to break down. All these alterations caused by the LRP internalization of aggregated LDL might hardly contribute to atherosclerotic 
plug progression and plug instability. LRP1 is a, is a large receptor that belongs to the LDL receptor family and it has an extracellular extremely large uh, alpha change and a transmembrane intracellular beta change. Alpha and beta change are not covalently associated on the cell surface. The alpha chain contains four clusters, but the most of the wide variety of, lig of ligands for this receptor bind to cluster two and cluster four. LRP1 has been, um, has been involved mainly in essential intracellular signaling. In fact, there are a lot of work explaining why LRP1 makes an essential signaling relating to a wide variety of ligands. Our group has consistently reported that LRP1 also can have proatherogenic effects, especially related to his capacity to internalize huge amounts of cholesterol esters to vascular smooth muscle cells. Therefore, it's important to take in mind that therapeutic strategies focused in this receptor should impair LRP1 interaction with aggregated LDL without touching all this LRP1 essential signaling. Bearing in mind to develop one strategy that specifically blocks the interaction of LRP1 with this proatherogenic ligand, aggregated LDL, we analyze the capacity of each cluster to interact with LDL. And for that, we clone in the sequence for each cluster into separate plasmids and transfected them into eukaryotic cells, which had the capacity to secrete these mini receptors to the extracellular medium. We could isolate these mini receptors and we make an ELISA uh, in the laboratory. And we tested the capacity of fluorescent aggregated LDL to bind to each of these particular clusters. And then as you can see here, aggregated uh, and, uh, here in this graph, bra in this bar graph, you can see that aggregated LDL specifically bind to cluster two in a dose dependent manner. Using different structural and bioinformatic tools, we predicted three well exposed and potentially immunogenic peptides in cluster two, P1, P2 and P3 that are located in different domains of this, of this cluster. LDL binding to peptides was again assessed by a fluorometric assay and we could see that P3 coated wells strongly bind aggregated LDL. So these findings indicate that cluster two domain CR9 is, crit is critical for aggregated LDL binding to LRP1. To have, uh, to have and to explore the biological uh, proof and, the, and testing the relevance of LRP1 LDL interactions, we generated anti-P1, anti-P2 and anti-P3 antibodies by immunization of rabbits with these peptides. The efficacy of these peptides to counteract the impact of aggregated LDL was explored in small muscle cells cultures. As expected, the uh, uptake of, ag of aggregated LDL induced a strong intracellular cholesterol ester accumulation in these cells. Being anti-P3 antibodies, the most effective reducing the intracellular cholesterol ester, as you can see here, by thin layer chromatography, also when we tested at different doses, and also as you can see by confocal microscopy images, where you can see that in the presence of these anti-P3 antibodies, you cannot uh, see almost a lipid droplet formation in these cells. So uh, on the view on, of the positive results obtained in in vitro studies, we designed an in vivo study in rabbits 
these rabbits were randomly assigned to three groups, one injected with uh, cardiac alone, other injected with an irrelevant peptide, and a third group injected with the P3 peptide. At the four recordatory, just half of the animals were a randomly fed show or high fat diet. And Annalisa Asai showed the high production of anti P3 antibodies in rabbits immunized with P3. Here, in phase preparation of the thoracic aorta, you can see as the animals fed with a high fat diet induce a high percentage of occupation of the aortic vasculature in the control groups, but not in the P3 immunized rabbits. Here is the uh, stain. You can see that the almost there is no fatty streaks in the in animals fed with this show diet. In monostochemical studies, reveal, uh, reveal a high percentage of lipids, specifically in the intima, in the control groups, but not in the P3 immunized rabbits. And you can see uh, similar results when we quantify the macrophages stained by RAM 11 in the intima. In the control groups, you have uh, a strong staining for macrophages that you cannot see in the case of P3 immunocyte rabbits. In agreement, thin layer chromatography after lipid extraction of aortas show a strong cholesterol ester accumulation directly in, this, uh, in the aorta, in the control groups, but not in the P3 immunocyte group. You can see that triglycerides and free cholesterol are similar uh, between the four groups, or between, the, between all the studied groups. And also you can see that when we check the pro-inflammatory mediators, the expression of pro-inflammatory mediators by Western blood and confocal microscopy, you can uh, see that uh, all of these results show that the high fat diet increase uh, the pro-inflammatory mediators you can see here and here, here and here. But this is not the case in the aorta of animals immunized with this P3 sequence. One thing that I would like to remark is that if this uh, strategy was highly efficient to inhibit lipid and pro-inflammatory signal in the aorta, the P3 immunization didn't impact hepatic lipid metabolism or the cardioprotective or, the, or has not the potential to alter the cardioprotective signal pathways in the heart. Why? This is because uh, this is because P3 immunization didn't alter the hepatic neutral metabolism of lipids, as you can see also in the lipoprotein profile, you can see that uh, there are no differences between the control or immunized animals in terms of the cholesterol transported by VLDL, LDL, or HDL. This means that there are no effects either at liver or um, plasma metabolism, lipo lipid metabolism. In hepatic cells, LRP1 mainly interacts with APOE and rich lipoproteins such as calomicrons that use a different cluster and domain to interact with LRP1. It has been published that these lipoproteins interact with LRP1 through cluster free and domain 17. That means that we are not altering the capacity of the liver to clearance lipoproteins and rich in cholesterol with this potential treatment, with this potential immunization. In addition, it has been reported that it's important that, it's important that uh, in the heart, there are cardioprotective signals induced by protease inhibitor com complexes that interact with LRP1. But the cluster reported for this interaction has been the cluster 2 and in particular the domains CR2 and CO3. 
So according to our previous studies, this, uh, this signaling is not altered by these specific antibodies generated to the CR9 domain. But in addition to the possibility of using this uh, specific sequence of the LRP1 to counteract LR L LDL aggregate, aggregated LDL binding and internalization, we checked the possibility that these peptides per se could efficiently protect LDL against LDL aggregation induced by enzymes that are present in the arterial intima. So we have a study. Uh, we, for, for that, we analyzed the impact of P3 that we now will call LP3 and his retroenantiomer version, which is DP3, on the process of LDL aggregation induced by sphingomyelinase. And as you can see here, these peptides inhibit the process of LDL modification induced by this enzyme. As you can see, the same pattern in the LDL treated with sphingomyelinase in presence of these peptides that in the native LDL. On the contrast, where the peptides are not present, you can see this LDL aggregates similar to those found, those found in the arterial intima on animals fed with high fat diet. You also can see here that in Western blood analysis, uh, in the case that you have the presence of these peptides, you have the similar pattern for APOV than in the case of native LDL, which is not the case in the in those uh, in the LDL that is uh, not treated with peptides or treated with an irrelevant peptide. So, by proteomic analysis of peptide. LDL complexes combined with molecular modeling of peptide LDL interactions and with a dual biochemical cell screening system, we obtain two uh, important translational outputs. By one side, we establish the structural nature of peptide APOV100 interaction. We conclude that these peptides preserve APOV conformation through key allostrostatic interactions between negative amino acids of the peptide and the highly positive charge sequence of the Apollo lipoprotein. On the other hand, the knowledge about the precise residues of the peptide involved in the interaction with APOV allow that to reach different peptide versions with maximal stability and permeability while at the same time keeping maximal efficacy. Here you can see the high correlation, correlation with, in terms of efficacy of these peptides to inhibit the L process of LDL aggregation and the process of foam cell generation. And uh, we have now in the lab a collection of 42 peptides which are extremely efficient to inhibit this processes, the proatherogeneity of LDL and the capacity of this LDL to generate foreign cell formation. Nowadays, there are uh, different attempts to try to control atherosclerosis through the use of apolipoprotein mimetic peptides that focus either in improving lipid profile, uh, improving uh, or preventing the process of LDL aggregation, LDL functionality, but also on different intracellular effects, try to decrease foreign cell formation like anti-inflammatory, lipoprotein clearance, cholesterol efflux, or other uh, antioxidant uh, alternatives. But like other uh, receptors and other plasma membrane protein, LRP1 can be cleaved by cell surface proteases to produce soluble form of LRP1, which can be detected in plasma and cerebrospinal fluid. This process 
can be accelerated by inflammatory mediators, as has been reported here, as for example, lipopolysaccharide and interferon gamma in uh, cell culture macrophages. And circulating LRP1 levels have been found increased in several pro-inflammatory diseases such as rheumatoid, rheumatoid uh, arthritis and systemic lupus erythematosus patients. Studies performed in our group showed that atherogenic lipoproteins induce the release of soluble LRP1 to the circulation from smooth muscle cells in a time and dose dependent manner. In addition, we, could, uh, we have the opportunity to test the levels of this receptor in the conditioning medium from coronary atherosclerotic plaque areas compared to non-atherosclerotic areas, and we also observe an increase in this receptor. We also test the circulating LRP1 levels in the plasma of a, a population of patients with familiar hypercholesterolemia, either severe of moderate of uh, no hypercholesterolemia. And as you can see, there is a, a strong increase of the levels of this receptor circulating in the plasma of uh, those with severe, severe hypercholesterolemia. Moreover, circulating uh, LRP1 levels were as significantly associated with pre-established proatherogenic lipid parameters, and importantly, circulating LRP concentrations were independently associated with the occurrence of carotid atherosclerosis in hypercholesterolemic population. In collaboration with uh, epidemiologists, we developed a case cohort study based on the follow-up of the Regicor uh, cohort, that is the Registra Gira Needle Court, performed here in Barcelona by the group of Dr. Marugat. And from the total cohort, we built a sub-cohort comprising 170 incident uh, um, coronary, art, coronary artery disease cases and uh, 512 randomly selected individuals. The median follow-up was 6.2 uh, years. And the group of participants who presented cardiovascular events showing higher levels of LRP1 than the subcohort. LRP1 was significantly associated with acute events even after adjustment for confounding factors, including age, sex, systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, leukemia, HDL cholesterol, and total cholesterol. And this association remained statistically significant even at fast after including LDL cholesterol as a confounding factor instead of total cholesterol. So we conclude that the levels of this receptor in plasma are independently associated with the incidence of coronary events. Here you can see uh, an images from coronary computed tomography and geography uh, that show the evolution of this uh, atherosclerotic plaque in two different patients in, in, and in two times, in two different times. So in this patient, you can see that this lesion, this atherosclerotic lesion is almost stabilized along the time. In these patients, by the contrary, the, uh, in a small time, this lesion has growth, uh, has a strongly growth, growth. So a crucial clinical question seems to be how to predict a plaque progression. Here in this study, uh, they, uh, they um, analyze patients stratified in four different groups based on baseline plaque burden and the progression of this plaque burden during one year. And they conclude that those patients that with an, a strong increment in annual uh, plaque burden experience the worst clinical outcomes. So a key challenge for the future is to identify circulated biomarkers of atherosclerotic plaque rapid progression. 
So to take home messages, we can say that LDL cholesterol has both a causal and an accumulative effect on the risk of cardiovascular atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, that cholesterol reducing strategies undoubtedly reduce coronary risk, an important residual risk is derived from vascular focal mechanisms that nowadays are currently untreated. Vascular smooth muscle cells are key players in plaque progression towards clinical events, and the self-intensive research as a source of biomarkers of coronary artery disease. And emerging innovative treatments are focused in the management of vascular lipid accumulation and inflammation. I would like to thank all of these agencies that have helped to and contribute to develop our work. Thank you very much for your attention. No se oye, no se puede, no se escucha, Jero. Ah, sorry, I was still on, I was still on mute. Yeah, thank you very much for this, uh, for this great talk, uh, Vicenta. And again, that shows that uh, the complexity of, of, of basically targeting uh, very common uh, very common disease that can be uh, lethal, so uh, of course as, as cancer. Uh, then I would have uh, quickly then a few questions uh, that are curiosities, of course, because I'm absolutely not as, uh, a biologist, and uh, but I'm. So you, you say that LRP1 so has been found as a biomarker for uh, coronary uh, atherosclerosis. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if it's only for coronary atherosclerosis. And my question is because in general, so in the, in the timeline of uh, atherosclerotic plaque developments, uh, you, you first have uh, aortic plaque developments and then in later stages, of uh, systemic evolution, so of, of, of atherosclerosis, then you start to have uh, coronary plaques. So are you able then to make the difference what is really specific uh, to, uh, to coronary or what then can be influenced by previous history of plaque developments, for example, in the aorta? Yeah, uh, this is the, the main problem of biomarkers, the, the specificity. Uh, LRP1 is a receptor that binds multiple ligands and therefore is involved in a lot of pathological processes, including Alzheimer, including uh, cancer. So um, this makes the things uh, complicated to find biomarkers. For that, uh, in the case of, of LRP1, we just uh, were interested in knowing what happens uh, concerning cardiovascular risks and association with plaques because we have a lot of, of background, basic uh, background working uh, with this receptor and showing that uh, this receptor really changes the phenotype of cells uh, to more prothrombotic uh, phenotype and all of these things that can contribute to uh, atherosclerotic plaque progressions. But in order to find biomarkers, we would like to add other possibilities to the LRP1, yes, to add a specificity to this biomarker. That's why, for example, we are using our knowledge about the peptides to make uh, this, uh, to, to try to find this uh, specificity. For example, one kind of experiment that we are uh, performing now in, in, in the lab is just to treat these vascular smooth muscle cells at the, uh, at the proatherogenic lipoproteins at the proatherogenic uh, level. This means that we can stop the process of aggregated LDL. We also can stop the process of form cell formation. So by proteomics, we analyze the proteome, the, the secretome of these cells. And then with this specificity criteria, to, we are going to try some uh, secreted proteins that respond to the specific criteria that if we prevent this phenomena, this, uh, we cannot find this, uh, these proteins in the secretoma. So with this criteria, then we uh, go to the plasma of patients and we try to look for these 
proteins. So the main is to have additional complementary uh, proteins besides LRP1 that can make uh, feel full more better the criteria of a specificity for atherosclerotic plaques. And this, this is, um, the, the question is, is critical because when you have some proteins uh, that, uh, that, that can be associated in patients with atherosclerotic plaque, the most essential for clinicians seems to be how to predict the progression of the plaque be because maybe you have uh, a stent, um, you have um, a, a extended atherosclerosis, atherosclerosis in all your coronaries, but this is an stable process. And then the, the, the patient has not so much risk of if these plaques suffer a rapid evolution. So you, ha you have to be able to see in one point uh, what is going to, uh, to succeed with the plaque. And the main limitation to find this is that really um, maybe we lack uh, from, um, from adequate in vivo models to, to analyze that. And here, I think that uh, all the learning matching and all of these new techniques will help a lot. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, thank you, Vicenta. Uh, before then, uh, giving the floor then to, to attend this, I have a quick question. So if I'm correct, uh, you have your co-author of uh, three patents, right? Related to your, to your work. Sorry, sorry, Jerome, I cannot uh, listen to you very well. If I am correct, you're, you're co-author of three patents uh, related to your work. Is that, is that correct? Can, can you repeat, Jerome? I can. Yes. Can you hear me now? Can you? Uh, very, very slightly. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you, you're you're our co-author of uh, three patents related to your work. So, yeah. can you comment so on this uh, on this patenting uh, process? So, what was then the target, and and what are the specific uh, claims uh, for, for for therapeutics? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, we get uh, first pat the first patent we get just with the sequence of the LRP1 that was involved in the interaction with aggregated LDL and the polyclonal antibodies that uh, against this peptide that were effective, uh, have been effective in vitro studies in human vascular smooth muscle cells directly obtained from the vasculature and also in a preclinical model as has can be the, the rabbit. So this patent was granted in use and uh, also was granted in Europe. Uh, it was a big effort to arrive to there, but then the institution, is, as there was not a specific interest by uh, companies in this uh, patent, it, it was abandoned. So then we uh, get a project to develop uh, peptidomimetics against this uh, um, uh, basic, sorry, based on this uh, peptide. And we get this, uh, in this uh, collection of new peptidomimetics that are available in the lab and that's in a, a live patent. Is we have this alive patent, patent uh, and, uh, with all of these peptides. And we are uh, working more in in vivo models, in more translational in vivo models, hoping that we can progress uh, in, in the evolution of these patents to the market. Hopefully, because <laughs> as as Laura comments before, it's not so easy. Because if the if, if the companies are not interested just in time, the institutions usually cannot assume the cost of of keeping in uh, alive the patent. So uh, even if you successfully get a good results, the patent uh, is not alive. But now we have these peptides that are uh, in a live patent, and we hopefully. Um, uh, maybe we can get the interest of some companies uh, working in cardiovascular, but as I mentioned before, uh, we are uh, seeing in our hospital interest by, uh, other, um, by other clinicians working, for example, in cerebrovascular diseases or also working in cancer that start to be interested in this 
in the field. So maybe we, maybe we are lucky and uh, we can get some interested company in uh, this in this patent. And the third patent is uh, concerning. And in this third patent, we are we have only a small participation. is lidered mainly by the University of Cadiz, and they are interested in micro RNAs uh, and some of the micro RNAs that we were working for in dilated cardiomyopathy. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, maybe maybe then to, to Julie, then explore his research, maybe then the, uh, the, the process of uh, trying to build a spin-off company uh, and, and be involved then in this, uh, in this new uh, in this new venture, as Laura did, maybe is a key uh, actually a, a key step. That's of course not an easy decision to take. Um, so we have a question from uh, Wabi. Uh, maybe Wabi, you want to uh, activate your mic and, and voice your question. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Um, I just had a question because um, in atrial fibrillation, uh, there's this cholesterol paradox. I think generally speaking, a cholesterol lower cholesterol is seen as a as a good thing, as cardioprotective. But in atrial fibrillation, there's a paradox, and I don't think people are quite clear why it's there, but it seems that the prevalence of AF is lower in people with high levels of cholesterol, both LDL and HDL. And I was just wondering whether sort of you may have an idea of sort of mechanisms behind that, because I'm, I'm not an expert on that at all, but whether you may have a comment on that or, or, or why that may be the case. Mm -hmm. So it has been uh, it has been shown by uh, by some authors that uh, it, it is, this receptor is crucial for these cardioprotective signals that come by, by protease uh, inhibitors in the heart. So uh, in, in in this case, cluster two in the, uh, is uh, crucial, but the domains are. Uh, far away from the domain that is involved in aggregated LDL uptake. So our in, uh, the inhibitors that uh, we are, the antibodies that uh, we propose in this development uh, will not alter this cardioprotective signaling. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much for that. Okay. So uh, I don't know if we have raised hands. No. So uh, actually, uh, listen, I have another question, uh, another curiosity. So you have uh, two profiles no, of patients at risk for uh, atherosclerosis. You have then those persons who definitively have metabolic syndromes because of uh, bad life habits and, and bad diet, etc. And, and then you have those patients who unluckily have a constitutive, uh, constitutive risk and constitutively high cholesterol production uh, in the liver. Um, is there a need to make a difference uh, between these two patients in terms of biomarker detection and then uh, therapeutic targets? Mm -hmm. Uh, you mean, for example, between diabetics, which uh, in day the atherosclerosis is uh, most rapidly progress uh, in this kind of patients from the from genetic, for example, from patients that are a genetic conditioning or something like that. Yes. Yeah, patients. Yeah, patients who are genetically prone then to have high cholesterol levels. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In in the case of, of diabetes, for example, uh, I have uh, two comments. By one side, all of these metabolic patients, diabetic, obese patients, they have an altered lipoprotein profile that makes them more, more much more, uh, with much more risk than the rest of population. Yes, because uh, this uh, LDL, small and dense that they have, uh, should be much uh, retained in the vascular world. So uh, this makes that they have a uh, higher, higher risk. On the other hand, all of this group of patients, uh, diabetics, obese, they have the epicardial fat that surrounds the coronary arteries, and that is other um, other factor crucial for atherosclerotic progression. So this group of patients, they uh, need earliest detection, and also they also uh, need the development of this uh, more more uh, focal uh, focused therapies uh, in, for their treatment. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then 
so before detecting so a really focal focal problem is there currently then ways to detect uh, signs of biological risks while everything is evolving uh, silently um yeah it's a, it's a good uh, it's a good question yes for example now in the in the clinical field there are uh, clinicians start to be interested in uh, knowing not only for example ldl or hdl cholesterol levels that is the usual measurements that they perform but also the size of ldl because in the LDL, you have a wide variety of uh, size particles. So for example, uh, there is a growing interest in knowing in patients, not only the quantity of cholesterol they have, but how this cholesterol is distributed between different size fractions of LDL. The problem is that the methodology is, uh, cannot be assumed by the health system because the way that nobody is assist to perform this kind of analysis is nuclear magnetic resonance. And this cannot be uh, performed for each patient. But as I said in one of my slides, uh, this knowledge seems to be important to calculate the, the risk of patient and has been demonstrated in some uh, clinical studies. Mm -hmm. No, on a, how challenging then uh, would it be to, to convince uh, actually the, the, I don't know, the hospital or um, the, the regulatory, regulatory system to automatically recommend some specific uh, radiologic explore, uh, exploration? Uh, is it something that um, has a, a formal process or is it extremely difficult? Um, I think it's, it's, it's difficult that uh, they perform a specific analysis. Um, I think uh, at least in our hospital is more uh, with people that has uh, some genetic background um, or something like that. If not, uh, it's, it's quite quite complicated. Um, even for example, uh, yeah, I think uh, um, image, uh, image techniques uh, are, uh, you are only, only uh, applicated if there is some uh, a specific problem, uh, cardiovascular problem, but not as a screening in general population, uh, even an intermediate risk or something like that. So, yeah, it's even um, it's a few people that uh, really can know how is the state of the coronary arteries and uh, biochemical analysis sometimes is not uh, predictive enough. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, no, going a little bit to the field of uh, of in silico modeling. So actually, your your research is uh, deeply based on uh, the best understanding you can have on specific molecular uh, molecular mechanisms, uh, and then the relationship so it can have with what you can measure in the in the real world. And on the other hand, you were also citing uh, machine learning technologies such as machine learning as technologies that could be very useful. So, where do you see that? Uh, where do you see that models uh, would be beneficial to your research by specifically mm -hmm. tackling um, better view of the molecular complexity? And where do you see that models would be mostly useful? In better, um, in better mining the existing real-world uh, data. I don't know. If, mm -hmm. I, don't know um, I, I, I think um, working with clinicians and uh, uh, trying to uh, to move to patients is essential uh, to analyze uh, of all of these things um, like molecular complexity of 
all the pathways that can be involved in the biomarkers that you are finding in the plasma of patients combined with uh, those that you find in your uh, make, uh, in your um, in your in vitro and in vivo system so it's essential to combine to combine all of this data to uh, really uh, in, in, in the particular field of biomarkers to be sure about a specificity and to be sure about the mechanic the mechanistical pathways that uh, could be crucial in patient treatment so for me uh, this collaboration of course is uh, is, is essential uh, if you want to translate your results to the clinical practice thank you so thank you very much uh, Vicenta. so um I think so we have uh, two minutes before the next talk. So maybe if there are no further questions, uh, we can stop here in order to ensure smooth transition. So do we have a uh, uh, last opportunity? Do we have a question? No hands raised. Okay, so we're on time, that's fantastic. Uh, Vicenta, thank you very much for sharing this, uh, this knowledge for the discussion and, uh, and for, your, for your time. Thank you very and, much. Uh, so now I will give them the floor to uh, the next uh, the next chairman, Maria. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you, Vicenta. Maria, are you here? We have 15 minutes breaks. Ah, yeah. we have 15 minutes. Yeah, break. but we can check with Maria if she's here. Yes. So we then. Uh,